So we define an operation of this form. Uh, how is it called? Compression. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, two vectors, on each, one on each side, and we have the, um, the matrix in between. So we saw that to rotate um, a vector, you only need a one rotation matrix, but to rotate a, a, a matrix, a tensor, you need two of them. And um, one is going to be the transpose uh, of the other. This leads to uh, a diagonalized uh, matrix that we'll, we're going to see in more detail. And um, the Well, this T is the uh, the potential, the kinetic energy. It's not a tensor, but yeah. this is the equivalent uh, of the dot product for. for tensors. So it's just a scalar. And if we align the, the axis of rotation with the z-axis, then the, uh, the inertia tensor becomes nice, easy to work with. OK, so a few more things about the inertia tensor. We know that it looks like this. The elements, the coefficients <clears throat> that are in the diagonal have this form. So this one's going to be r minus y, this one's going to be r minus z. And the ones that are in the off diagonal positions, uh, they have this form. So, what happens if we uh, switch the order of x and y over here? Well, nothing really, right? Uh, you still have that, that product. Uh, so over here, we usually write y, x. But y, x is the same as x, y. So So we can write it like that. So even though we have nine coefficients, only six of them are independent. These three and these three. Or I guess you can pick one of these and these two or something. Uh, but you get the idea. If we take 
the transpose, so this is, let's call it A, how is the transpose of A going to look like? How do you transpose? Like in your in your head, when you're doing it right now. Rotate. Okay. Uh, so this one is going to be in this position. This one in this position. This one in this position. Uh, they have the same value. So I guess. The transpose of A is also A. What if we take the, the conjugate? So we put an asterisk in each one of them. What is the conjugate? How do you define it? So if you have um, this complex number, how do you take the, the conjugate? Two minus. Hmm? Minus? Two minus. Good. This is the imaginary part, right? And are those values, do they have an imaginary component? So, I don't know how to write it. We can take the conjugate of the transpose, and that's equal to matrix A. Uh, how do we call that kind of matrix? The main implication is that their uh, eigenvalues are going to be real, uh, which is, well, I guess before quantum mechanics, we didn't really have to worry about these things. But um, this is the um, an operator that is Hermitian, so you could use it uh, in quantum mechanics if you want it. Okay. Um, we have looked, I guess, uh, in detail at how to rotate um, a body about a single point, right? So it's going to look like this. Or if the, if the point is inside of the rigid body, then it might rotate, you know, it will have a, um, something that looks like this rather than like this. Um, but we haven't really looked too much at translations. So what happens to our machinery that we have so carefully built if we change the origin? Then just, well, the tensor will change, right? Because the tensor is defined relatively to the origin of one. Isn't that bad? Kind of, I think. Yeah. I mean, you know, we work so much, and then you change the origin, and it changes everything. Well, uh, let's see what we can do. So let's say that this was our point of rotation, and 
you know, we're doing like a circle around it. And so we're going to have a vector. Actually, we're going to have many of these. Uh, this is ri, ri. And you have one of these for each particle in your rigid body. And I guess that was all we had to worry about. The axis, I guess the origin of the translation, let's call it axis, was on the body, right? So uh, the origin was here. What if we move it, uh, let's say, you know, over here? So this is our new origin. The axis of rotation, well, actually, I'm not going to write that yet. We have this other vector. We're going to call it capital R. And it's just the actual translation that we did. And so we have a new vector. Ri. So let's call this one Ri prime. It's the old one. So now we have to build, um, I guess, the, the machinery for, for this case. So we're going to leave this here for a little bit. Do you remember the definition of moment of inertia? That you learn in your baby physics? If it's the mass multiplied the square something. Sum of that, right? So each particle, um, you get the, the distance multiplied times on squared, multiplied times the mass. If we are using Einstein notation, then you don't need the sum. So what is this R? Is the distance from the particle to where? Um, yeah. Almost. Mm -hmm. So, actually, I should not call it R because we can get confused with this one. I'm going to call it S because yeah, it's the next letter in the alphabet. Uh, so this is the the baby physics definition of I. And notice that uh, it's a scalar. So it's the, the perpendicular distance to the axis of rotation. So in many cases of interest, like uh, for example, you want to you know, rotate something about its center of mass, then well, it's already there. If you want to rotate it from here, then pretty much all these particles are going to have the same distance. So um, it's to the axis of rotation. So I'm going to make a few drawings. I guess the first question is, do you have a, a disk or anything? And you rotate it about its center of mass. And you have the same object, but now you rotate it through this axis. Which one has a higher moment of inertia? Yeah. 
Yeah, this is like a much bigger rotation. Answer? Huh? That one. Good. You have a voice. You can use it. Yeah, you know, if you pick a um, like a really long rod or something, it's almost impossible to, to rotate. It's kind of cool. Um, okay, so what about the angle over here between between the axis and so vector r it will be um, ninety degrees. This is not the the angle that we care about though. So what if we start to rotate? I guess we can look at the the other um, extreme in which the angle, the axis of rotation is like this. Uh, then you have an angle over here of R and uh, the axis of zero. So I guess this is still your, your pivot point. This is your pivot point over here. So you can have all these intermediate ones, right? So I guess I can draw it here. N was aligned with the with the axis of rotation. So we can move, we can uh, put the axis at an incline like this. Um, how will the rotation look like if you, your axis is like that and your pivot point is over there? Kind of, and if, if it's like this, it will be moving kind of like this around, right? So um, you can have you know more in between. So you want the the perpendicular distance from wherever you are, you know, this point or this point or this point to uh, the axis. So, you know, this can come from like behind, this one like going from, maybe there's a few that are like directly um, beneath, but you always have an angle of 90 degrees there by definition. That's the, uh, the perpendicular distance. And so this angle over here, which I'm gonna call alpha, is the angle between um, R and N. So I'll try to draw it over here. This is N. Um, this is R I. And SI is a distance, the perpendicular distance. So in this case, SI is also uh, this vector. And N uh, is normalized to one, so the unit vector. I kept thinking about kind of moving uh, this axis down but grab to the pivot and so it will move the disc in this direction. Uh, oh, this is Ri prime. Is the one um, 
that originates uh, there. So then this is N and this is SI prime. The primes are important um, and so on, right? You can have another case, a pivot now moved over here. And so your angle is like this. So this is Ri prime. This is um, Si prime. So we have the angle over here, 90 degrees, uh, not 90, you know, becoming uh, smaller. And if I want to, I know Ri, if I want to calculate Si, um, what is it? in terms of Ri and the angle. Hmm? Times sine theta or just theta? This is your triangle, right? Yeah. If it's a right angle, the, the angle between Si and Si, yeah, it's going to be same. So Si, prime is going to be Ri prime, the magnitude, times sine of the angle between N. Uh, actually, this one is between R and N. So N, you know, it gives us direction, but it doesn't um, change this result because its magnitude is 1. And so you can see that the farthest away that the particle can be is actually Ri. And as it starts to rotate, it's going to get closer and closer to, uh, to the axis. And of course, it cannot be less than 0. So we have um, this relationship, and in fact, why not? You know, we can put n over here. So, what does it look like now? Cross yeah, it's, it, this distance uh, is the magnitude of the cross product. It's not the the, is the direction. I uh, will be wrong, but it has the right magnitude. Um, yeah, it goes in the extreme, it's zero, so it is on the axis uh, as i is zero. I prime and in the definition of the moment of inertia we had a squared over there so that means that it's SI prime dot SI prime and Si is given by r cross n, uh, r, ri prime cross n dot ri prime cross n. And I guess you arrange them in that order so that it's uh, right-handed like the angle is in this direction. Um, last time, we defined N as, actually, I 
give us uh, the magnitude of the angular velocity and now we will get the direction uh, using um, the unit vector n. So we have that definition. That means that n is um, the vector omega divided by the magnitude. So we can put it directly in here. So now we divide uh, by omega squared. And we wanted the moment of inertia. So that's uh, the sum over uh, the masses for the particles times that. OK. Why do we need the um, vector? Like, they don't, they don't give us a scalar, right? So, so don't Here? The left side? Yeah, S is square. Yeah. Do we need a vector here? Do we need what? The arrow, which is. Um, we need the arrow, yeah. It's not for that we give us a scalar. Um, no, you, you only need, so it's a weighted average. So it will be kind of difficult to add all the different vectors uh, in here. So this is just a number. So you need uh, everything. So the, the mass is a scalar. You need another scalar for the moment of inertia. And you, know, you have a lot of particles that they are um, in every direction. So you might have you know, another one over here. So it will be this one. So it's just the, uh, the weighted average. Make sense or no? I was thinking that the dot product will give us a scalar. Uh, you need the dot product to get the scalar, right? The squared. But as I, uh, it's this vector from Ri to the axis of rotation. So, uh, and we define it as, you know, with the cross product, so actually just the magnitude of the cross product. We could have, no, I guess this is fine. It doesn't matter if you have a direction for the cross product because you have the dot product here. OK, um, the other quantity that we derived using that nice operator was this one, the velocity. You know, for this particular symmetry in which you have a single uh, rotation point, it's uh, omega cross r. So using this relationship, we got that the kinetic energy was 1 half um, of mi vi. This is your vector squared. And so that means that this one we have to switch it. Um, but you switch both of them, you still have your, um, your, you have negative and negative, that's positive. So I is going to be twice the uh, kinetic energy divided by omega squared. So this is a velocity, this is the other velocity. This is your mass, so that is twice the kinetic energy. And well, that's, uh, I think you have seen that expression. D 
the other quantity that we derived last time was using the uh, contraction. And we got uh, the same one, well, with the omega square. One half i omega square. So we kind of derived all the equations from, uh, from introductory mechanics. So that's nice. It's very important to remember that this is a tensor, and this one is a scalar. So one is the moment of inertia and moment of inertia tensor. OK, so now uh, we know all these relationships. We can go back to uh, that problem. It's called, well, this was the original axis. Let's call it B. And this is the new axis. Let's call it A. So we want to, we know what is the definition of the moment of inertia. So for this case, it is going to be mi si squared. What is si squared? Not prime. Over here. From here, yes? Getting the displacement from the axis that I mean. From? Well, the total. Will you repeat that? Isn't like um, the total length of the axis that I mean? Or am I confused? Uh, so this length? No, it's, well, no, I'm confused. <laughs> it has to be a little longer. Yeah. Wow. But it is the distance to the axis. So, you know, before we define SI prime as being the perpendicular distance from the point to the axis, and we have the same thing here, but now SI goes all the way over here. This is RI before we had RI prime. So we had all the components, it's just that, uh, well, they have different values now. Ri is equal to um, R plus Ri prime. Okay, so this is just mi, and we can put what we got before with the ri cross n, um, not primed, and this is squared. 
And with that relationship for Ri, we have, let's call this one Ia, because it's the, about the axis A. So we have that. Uh, we can distribute the bulk product. So this will be R cross N plus Ri prime cross N. And taking the square, we're going to have mi r cross n squared. And now there will not be another index to be repeated, so we don't want to lose the mass. You can either add over all the particles, or you know, let's just call it capital M is the total mass of the rigid body. And then we have the term in the middle. R cross N and R I prime cross N. And that one at the end. Ri prime cross n um, squared. So let's focus now on this one, the middle one. How can we move this mi inside here? Can we do it? Will um, vectors allow us, allow us to do that? Yes? Is this mi multiplying each of these terms? That's what a regular algebraic uh, quantity will do. So in order to be consistent with the cross product, um, this one, you know, can definitely move the mi over here. I'm gonna put it over here. And so we have two times this one, dot mi times this one. And when you put uh, one scalar inside of the cross product, you multiply only one of them. So this could be, I'm just gonna put it over here, mi. And that's good because otherwise it will mess up our system. So we have uh, this quantity over here. And these, what does it look like? I'm gonna write it big over here. It's mi times ri. What is it? Remember that we have a sum for all i's. Moment? It is the first moment.
So if you add all the mi's, what do you get? Total mass, right? So this is a zero zeroth moment. If you add an r over here, this is the first moment, and this gives you the center of mass. Well, and if you have two ri's, so it's a squared, this is the second moment, and this will give you the moment of inertia. I don't know what the other ones do. I don't know if people look at higher moments. Uh, but this is the center of mass. And the definition of the center of mass actually is I guess we use an informal version. This mi ri minus big R equals zero. Right, so you have to find one vector r that, given all of these, uh, will make the sum equal to zero. And ri minus r, we have it over here. Going to be R I prime. So we have M. I guess we don't have the sum sign, but or symbol. We have M I R I uh, prime, and I think it's what we have over here. So that's equal to what? Zero. Does it make sense? So your rotation was about um, that center of mass. So we can get rid of that term. Um, the whole thing is zero. And so we have this one and this one. The third term, what is it? It's ri prime cross n squared. Um, there should be an mi. What is it? Yep, based on the axis B. So we can write this whole thing as So the moment of inertia about any axis is going to be equal to the moment of inertia about the center of mass plus, this looks like a moment of inertia too, is the moment of inertia of a single particle with this mass located at distance r from the rotation. It's kind of nice. How is that called? That theorem. Yeah. 
Awesome. Okay, so let's go back to our tensor friend. So we just learned that, oh surprise, if you change the origin of your coordinate system, uh, all the quantities are going to, to change. But you know, they change in a very reasonable ways and um, I guess easy to recalculate. Uh, this means that for the operator, Um, you, you move the origin and everything inside also changes. But that's probably good news. Let's say that we have stop working. We have our Cartesian system. It's kind of at an incline. And you have your, your operator. I guess I'm going to start drawing it initially just like a vector. How do I align the Cartesian system with the vector? Let's say that this one um, so this is x, y, uh, X, Y, and Z. And the object is like this. How do I align the Cartesian system with the vector in this direction? As I'm moving the coordinate system, or? How do you move it? Yeah, rotation matrix, rotation operator. So, um, how do you go about doing it? Let's say this is a 45 degrees and 45 degrees here. Well, you grab your system, you rotate it 45 degrees with respect to X, and then you rotate it 45 degrees with respect to uh, sorry, uh, Z, and then with respect to X, right? So in general, if you have a vector, uh, you need two rotations to align it with one of the axes. Can we do that with a tensor? Yes. Uh, last time we showed that while this is true, for vectors, you can rotate the vector or the coordinate system. Uh, for for tensors, we needed two of them, one on each side, and this one has to be the transpose. Actually, it has to be the inverse, but for rotation matrices, the inverse is equal to the transpose, so this is easy to do. So we can find three angles 
uh, always our angles. And you know, we have our, I guess, a general uh, rotation matrix. We can find triangles, psi, theta, and phi that will allow you to have a diagonal matrix. What is so special about diagonal matrices? You guys are so quiet. Do you remember in middle school when like, you have to uh, solve this system of equations with algebra? Like, you could add them or you could, you could substitute. You remember? So what is this? Hmm? Nothing. Um, the same I thing. Doing that in you don't? So if we have one um, value for each row and, and column, then that is the solution of the system of equations, right? So and this is really cool because it tells you that using two rotation operators, you can find the solution. So if this is the solution, the eigenvalues of the matrix are, well actually, let me use the operator. Um, it operates on the angular velocity. So if I is diagonal, we get L1 equals I1 omega 1, L2 equals I2 omega 2, and L3 equals I3 omega 3. There's another uh, way to uh, realize that you can diagonalize that matrix, and um, I guess I mentioned it last time. We saw that the off-diagonal elements are of this form. So these two are always different, and they're always missing one of them. So you can align um, with the z-axis, and then this will be 0 and 0 by definition. So this is definitely diagonal style. Oh, I can't say that. You can diagonalize it. And Is diagonal, how will this one look like? We have the definition, right, of of the contraction. So you have the Einstein sum over there. So if these off-diagonal elements are not zero, then you get a bunch of stuff that is not necessarily nice to see. But if they're zero, what is the kinetic energy? Well, let's call these the k arrow, I mean the k um, direction and this one the J direction. So 
So we get it's gonna be I X X and I guess because you're going to have only three, they change the notation to one, two, three, which is what I used over here. So it's going to be uh, I1, omega1 squared plus I2, omega2 squared plus I3 omega 3 squared and all of that divided by 2 so you get a scalar as you should and life is simple when you have diagonal matrices system of equations that is a square matrix so you have the same number of equations as number of uh, unknowns has a solution in general ah. if this is true If you can find a matrix that you can take the inverse, multiply it in this way, and you diagonalize um, the matrix in between. Okay, so this one, this I, let's call it ID. So is your di diagonalized matrix? It's kind of uh, you know the basis of everything because if you have this matrix. You can get the moment of inertia about um, any axis uh, that you can possibly want. And with the other theorem that we showed, the parallel axis, you can uh, also translate it. So the I1, uh, I2, I3. Oh, this one is nice. Are the eigenvalues? Which ones are the eigenvectors? options this one has your, your eigenvalues so the eigenvectors are going to be the rows um, or columns depending on whether it's a transpose or not uh, of the rotation matrix that you use so eigenvectors in uh, rows of rotation matrix and these i's uh, when especially when the matrix is diagonalized um, it's called the principal 
moment of inertia. With emphasis in the principle. Moment of inertia. And the eigenvectors are called the principle. If you want to move to, if, if you want to rotate, I guess if you want to move your, if you want to tilt your axis, then you just do the opposite operation. So let's call it I. It's going to be um, a different one call it S, this is your diagonal matrix, and this is S. So you rotate about um, any axis, so you see the Euler angles, and you have the moment of inertia. And finally, uh, what are the, I guess in the general case, in this case, where you have some non-zero values for the off-diagonal elements. How do you calculate the, the moment of inertia, the coefficients? Well, it will be Um, and your, your other stuff in there. Um, over here will be I2 minus I, and I3 minus I. Or I guess if you want to make it more explicit, you know, just use lambdas. This is sort of the um, oh. Make this equal to zero, the determinant, and you get your characteristic equation. Because we are in three dimensions, you at most are going to have three roots, and those roots are the moment of inertia about the different principal axes. Okay. Um, finally, when we do not have, uh, when these are not zero, then you have all the other numbers in here that I actually got last time. Mm. Well, anyways. The other cool thing about uh, this moment of inertia is that what is the equation of a circle? Not parametric. I can say one is equal to, and this is x, and this is uh, y. So x squared plus y squared, right? What is the equation of a sphere?
It's easy to predict, no? It's fear. So, does that resemble anything? If you wanted the equation of a um, an ellipse, how would you modify the equation of a circle? Well, you add something here to to add some factor. So. Uh, if these two are equal, then you have the circle. Otherwise, you have, uh, it could be uh, elongated. And in the three-dimensional case, you have, and it could be elongated in one direction, narrow in the other. And so the equation of the kinetic energy uh, forms a shape. And the shape tells you about the symmetry of the, of the body that you're dealing with. For example, if you have something that looks like this, try to make it more. How many uh, principal moments does it have? Third principal axis. And so it's supposed to be a three-dimensional figure. Comes up. You can rotate it. Three-dimensional object. How many principal axes could it have? Three. Which are the three? Six. Hmm? Six. Yep. So um, you'll put them through the center of mass. Maybe it'll be over here. So you have the z axis, um, x, and um, maybe y coming out. So one is definitely different than the other ones. If you look from up here, you will notice that the x and y are symmetric. So two of these values are going to, have to be equal. Um, what the book says is that in all cases, in all situations that you can solve analytically, you can get the principal axis by inspection, which makes sense. Um, what about that? This one over here. What symmetry does he have? Same as that one. Yeah. Okay, cool. Let's, uh, let's go home. <laughs>